Well, thank you very much for the invitation to uh, speak in this uh, this August uh, association. I'll just put my fan on the time scale so that I know if I don't want to take too long. Now, um, one of the major one of the major arguments for the creation of the Australian nation, which was created in 1901, was that it would produce something unique in the world, what our first Commonwealth Prime Minister Edmund Barton called a nation for a continent and a continent for a nation. And this was especially attractive because of its implications for national security. In the 1890s, the Architects of Federation saw that unlike Europe and the Americas, whose history had been pervaded by territorial warfare, Australia's absence of land, uh, land borders with other nations would be one of its best guarantees for peace and stability. And so far, they've been proven right. Now, tonight I want to focus on, uh, even though you're doing this in a couple of weeks, I want to focus on the constitutional referendum for the voice because it raises um, many of the uh, many issues um, and that, that put all of the uh, of of the benefits that um, that Barton and his and his uh, and his peers thought were um, worth forming a nation for. The the voice referendum should be seen not merely as a sympathetic means of reducing the violence and, and other problems of Aboriginal people in remote communities, but as a potential threat to Australia's unique geographic and political status. And this is because Australia's political class today is unwilling to accept a position in contemporary Australia as an ethnic minority group. Its members want political power that is commensurate not with their numbers in the population, but with the fact that they got here first. They want other Australians to recognise the so-called distinct rights that, that purportedly flow to Aborigines because they are the descendants of what are now called the First Nations. And that title, I should point out, is, is not uh, an Indigenous title. It's borrowed from uh, North America, in particular Canada, um, and it's recently become embedded in our political language by what's ob pretty obviously to me um, a relentless public relations campaign funded by I don't know who, but certainly funded by people um, who have had the, a, a victory in, in changing di uh, discussion in the media from Aborigines and then Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders now to First Nations. Uh, I'll talk about the concept of that, uh, that title a little bit more in, 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 as I go along. But, um, what, what, um, what this, uh, this campaign has done is consolidated the objectives that were once on the far left of the Aboriginal political movement. And by the far left, the Aboriginal political movement, I mean the, the group that emerged in the 1960s uh, uh, under the name of Black Power, which was an imitation of the um, American Black Power movement. Um, but now the, um, the far left of the Aboriginal movement have become... The, the, the policies of the far left of the Aboriginal political movement have become the central agenda of the demand for constitutional change. And you can't understand what's really going on behind this demand until you know what the long-term objectives are. And one of the people who, who founded those long-term objectives was Michael Mansell, a Tasmanian um, a, 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 and the founder of a black power group in the 1960s called the Aboriginal Provisional Government which was um, a version of the, um, of the uh, Vietnamese pr provisional government that was waging war against from the north to the south, a very 60s um, um, title. Um, and Mansell was an uncompromising advocate of this position. Uh, in, in 2003, in a, the book Treaty, Let's Get It Right, Mansell argued that the fundamental choice for Indigenous people in Australia was whether they wanted to be Aboriginal Australians, um, which he called, who he called the original people who lost their country and consented to become citizens of Australia, or whether they wanted to be known as Australian Aborigines, who retained the inherent rights of the original people whose lands were <laughs> invaded, and I'm, I'm quoting Mansell here, whose lands were invaded and are now occupied, unquote. 
Mansell says those who accept the first proposition become committed to a social contract, whereas those like him who prefer the second op opposition sh should hold out for a more powerful political settlement. And the former, he says, fail to re recognise the, their true interests as Aboriginal people because citizenship is uh, Australian citizenship is no more than another version of the old uh, policy now now derided by by pretty well everybody of assimilation, which he says renders uh, the Aborigines a politically impotent group in a democracy because they're a minority group and, and they can't control the votes of them in the, in, in the, in the democracy. Uh, instead, he wants, and I'll quote him, he wants Aboriginal people to take our place among the nations and peoples of the world, among the, sorry, he wants Aboriginal people to take our place among the, among the nations of the world, not beneath them. Now, Marshall, now Mansell was not saying anything new. Members of the Aboriginal political class have been engaged in their own political long march for at least 50 years now. And many have argued that gestures like treaties and constitutional amendments are not ends in themselves, but simply concessions from white people in the journey towards the real goal. And the real goal is Aboriginal sovereignty over their own territory. And the case they argue, and, and I don't, I'll, I'll, I'll describe their, um, their, their case without, um, I hope you don't think that I, I believe it, but nonetheless, they argue that the foundation of the British colony in 1788 did not extinguish the sovereignty of the Indigenous peoples, like the native title that, that the High Court's Marbo judgment found had continued after colonisation. Proponents um, of today's Aboriginal politics claim that pre-1788 Aboriginal government and laws were never legitimately extinguished either, and they should be restored. And if laws could be revived, then sh so should Aboriginal governments be revived. They wanted a treaty to complete what they called the unfinished business of colonisation. Now, in April 2009, Kevin Rudd's Labor government uh, took Australia down this road, by, uh, which, which was also being proposed by the United Nations. Rudd formally endorsed the UN Declaration of Indigenous Rights. Now, now that UN de uh, Declaration was largely written, if you go into its background, you find that it was largely written by the Australian activist Mick Dodson. Um, it, he, he spent a decade in Geneva, in the Geneva office, in fact, of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, ATSIC, um, all paid for by the Australian taxpayer. Um, um, writing a, a, a declaration for the Indigenous people of the world, but primarily focused on the Indigenous people of Australia, without admitting that that was the case. Now, given the enormous sense of grievance expressed by the current Aboriginal establishment, and given the fact that its members are prominent activists, advocates within the International First Nations movement, it would be naive to imagine that if their demands are met, that Aboriginal leaders would be satisfied to confine themselves um, to the provision of municipal services, health reform or welfare payments, because they can see a far more ambitious goal is within their reach. And that is the goal of, of which Michael Mansell describes as taking our place among the nations and peoples of the world, not beneath them, which was once regarded as a utopian demand from the far left, but it's now become the centre of Aboriginal politics. In Australia, a constitutional uh, amendment like that I proposed for The Voice would provide a bargaining position for Indigenous people to exert far more influence over our national government than anyone now imagines. It would also provide a political platform from which to play to a world audience and to make allies who would not necessarily share mainstream Australian concerns. And, um, I don't have to give you um, a, a, a short history of the of the uh, recent developments in the Australian in the um, South Pacific, where we have China as now a predatory imperial power, um, which is which is locked up um, uh, the the um, um, 
um, Guadalcanal and um, and the <laughs> but the what's Solomon the, Islands. the Solomon Islands. Thank you, um, and which has um, it has uh, Fiji and several other uh, targets within its reach. Um, th these were. The, um, anyway, that's that's that that's the that's the framework in which this is this is um, this has been given. Hmm. Um, let, let me let me g give you some examples of what of what the what this means. Um, the 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 the, um, the the Uluru statement from the heart which is the basis of what's called the voice, um, demands that, uh, that Aboriginal people should achieve self-determination, autonomy and self-government. And so far, there's been no major analysis of what that means and there's no, no major critique of it. But let, so let me start on that process. In, in 2017, the Uluru Statement um, defined the voice as a proposal to change the Australian Constitution to give individual Aboriginal communities complete autonomy to advise the Australian government and parliament what they want. And, and even though they are only in an advisory position, it's not hard to see that, 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 that a, a constitutional uh, status would give them the right to demand that the, the Commonwealth uh, government and, and, and the bureaucracy, who it's also being prepared to um, give advice to, uh, it's um, oh dear. Um, anyway, I'll, I won't. I'll, I'll just go on. The eventual goal of the, of the voice is to make treaties between the Commonwealth and what it calls the First Nations. Its proponents don't want it, don't want just to keep their adopted title as nations. Um, they want to be real nations. So the actual, actual objective of the voice is that each individual clan or language group should be recognised as a nation and for the Commonwealth to make a treaty with each one, as if it were a separate state. Aboriginal activists now want statehood, self-government and an independent legal system for each self-identifying Aboriginal clan that gains native title. And they want the Australian taxpayer to fund it all. This is obviously a radical program for the revision of the Australian Federation. All of it is in the interests of Aboriginal people, but there's no thought to how it could possibly be in the interests of the rest of us. Let me remind, uh, let me remind you of the version of Australian history that they will be required to accept. The Uluru Statement, or at least um, there was an original long version which uh, has now been cut down to a one-page abbreviation which you can find online, but which it doesn't tell the whole of the story. But um, the Uluru Statement, uh, in its original form, made a series of assertions advocating the following, and I'll, I'll quote them. We have coexisted as First Nations on this land for at least 60,000 years. Our sovereignty pre-existed the Australian state and has survived it. We have never ever ceded our sovereignty. The unfinished business of Australian nationhood includes recognising the ancient uh, jurisdictions of First Nations law. The law was violated by the coming of the British to Australia. The First Nations refused to acquiesce the disposition and, and fought for the sovereign rights and their land. Now that is why they call themselves, they now call themselves by the Canadian term, First Nations. The Canadians had some grounds for being regarded as nations because some of the treaties that the Indian tribes signed with um, the British and, and, and French imperialists were, um, were, were treated them as, as, um, as, as, as if they were nations. But in Australia, there's no such treaties, even though um, there were many agreements, which I, 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 hopefully I'll get to talk about tonight. Um, the term First Nations derives from 20th century um, American politics and does not fit in Australia. Aboriginal clans or tribes, in, which in most cases were no more than extended families, never attained any status resembling nationhood either before 1788 or at any time after. 
there were no First Nations on this land for 60,000 years, as the Uluru Statement asserts. And this was confirmed in 1836 in the seminal judgment of William Burton in the New South Wales Supreme Court. Um, and it's been repeated several times since by Australian judges. And um, one of the most notable comments on this was um, Harry Gibbs' comments in 1979, who said, it is not possible to say that the Aboriginal people of Australia are organised as distinct political society separated from others, or that they have been uniformly treated as a state. They have no legislative, executive or judicial organs by which sovereignty might be exercised. If such organisations did exist, they would have no powers except such as the law of the Commonwealth or of a state or territory might confer upon them. The contention that there is in Australia an Aboriginal nation exercising sovereignty, even of a limited kind, is quite impossible in law to maintain." Unquote. Now, solving this problem is the real reason why the Aboriginal political class want to change Australia's constitution. It's the basis of their, their appeal for the voice. Um, we've had uh, Aboriginal advisory groups who, who've been um, uh, ha having various uh, uh, connections um, and various political statuses to the Australian governments since the, since the um, uh, late 1960s when, uh, when Abri uh, Nugget Coombs and uh, Bill Stanner and a couple of other people uh, formed uh, an advisory group for the McMahon Liberal government and there have been, I think, seven or eight different bodies ever since. You don't need a constitutional change to become an advisor to the Commonwealth Government and these days with the media and, um, and corporate um, uh, society very much on the Aboriginal side, um, they, have, uh, they are in a sitting position to have a great amount of influence. So why are they so keen on changing the Constitution? They say it's because um, when ATSIC was in office, uh, the, that was the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, which was, uh, which was the advisory group to the Commonwealth Government for about 10 years. Uh, in, in the end, the Howard Government sacked um, ATSIC and, and it did that with approval by the Labor Party because of corruption at, at, at its highest level. And um, not only corruption, but um, uh, Jeff Clark was um, um, accused of being uh, a rapist and, and, and uh, 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 um, the sort of, um, um, I'm just trying to think of the term, um, the term of alpha male who, um, who, who, who in various societies made, made women do what he wanted to do. And, and, um, and the ATSIC was, um, was um, abolished. Now, uh, people say uh, people in defence of constitutional <coughs> amendments say, "Well, we, uh, we we don't want to have to, to be forced to um, to um, by uh, by governments to disband." Well, the way to avoid that, of course, is not to have corrupt officials and not to have um, people like Jeff Clark running the show. It's not um, to change the Australian Constitution, um, which is a totally different thing altogether. Um, The, uh, as well as the claim that um, Aboriginal people are, are, are nations, um, they say we have never ever ceded our sovereignty. Um, however, um, before the colonisation of Australia, Aboriginal people never had any sovereignty to, to cede. Sovereignty is a term from international law, or what was in the 18th century called the law of nations. And the two, two European authorities on international law at the time, Christian Wolfe and Emmerich de Vattel, both argued that for a society to be a genuine nation, it must have sovereignty over a territory and its people, um, um, so, sorry, have sovereignty over a ter territory and its people, and as a corollary, only nations could have gen genuine sovereignty. Now, Justice William Burton's 1836 judgment found that Aborigines did not have anything that amounted to what the British and other nations could regard as statehood or nationhood. And he said, and I'll quote him, um, they had not attained at the first settlement to, to such a position in point of numbers and civilization as to form a government or laws, or to be entitled to be recognized as so many sovereign states governed by laws of their own, unquote. 
Now that was that was a judgment, and, and on the on the um, law of um, of uh, precedence, said, defining the law in court that um, prevailed uh, that's prevailed until our, our own time. But the reason that um, the Aboriginal people want to um, change the constitution is partly to change the defini the legal definition of sovereignty um, and and put it onto Aboriginal communities where it has never up until now belonged. Uh, and I should just say that um, William Burton, um, who, um, who who made that judgment, was not some great white white male ogre. Um, he was um, he was an evangelical Christian. Uh, he was very concerned about the relations with settlers um, and and, uh, and Aborigines, and he used to uh, investigate uh, charges outside of his position as a judge. When, uh, when, when charges of um, illegal killings of Aborigines were made. Um, he was the judge who in 1838 um, sentenced the seven white stockmen to death um, for the Mile Creek Massacre, and they were, they were hanged, you know, hanged in Sydney in, the, um, in Taylor Square. Now, what, uh, the, another change that is um, to... to um, to the legal status of what the current demands are is that is is the claim that sovereignty is a spiritual notion, and it derives from land ownership. Um, the the short version of the Uluru Statement tries to get around the problem of international law by redefining the concept of sovereignty and tying its its meaning to the one fact that is in the Aboriginals' favour that they were indeed the first to own land on the Australian continent. And their claim in the, in the voice it says in full, quote, sovereignty is a spiritual notion, the ancestral tie between the land and mother nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil, or better, of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished and coexists with the sovereignty of the crown, unquote. Actually, in, in Quadrant Online, uh, we now have it's not the top item now, but if, but if you scroll down a little way, you'll find something we put up about a week ago by, by um, a, a PhD student in, in Queensland who um, traced the origins of the, uh, of the idea of a spiritual notion. And it, um, <laughs> it, goes, it goes through the, um, <coughs> the, um, um, the, ch the case in Morocco, the case in the Western Sahara, which was the big case that uh, defined... Um, um, uh, uh, define its, its sovereignty um, being spiritual, um, and find, found out that um, it originated in um, in the um, a, a, in a what would you call him a sort of a spokesman for um, Mobutu, the leader of the Congo, who was in the process of um, of uh, fighting off authorities and, and, and invented this uh, idea of spiritual notion. It's um, uh, it's a recent creation. It's not something that um, it, it can be found in any of the scriptures, in any of the religions, anywhere apart from a couple of Congo religions, perhaps. Um, but there are other things wrong with the idea that sovereignty is a, is a spiritual notion as well. Um, first, sovereignty has never been accepted in international law as a spiritual notion. The, um, the Western Sahara case rejected the Mobutu claims. Um, and it's not been adopted by any of the 200 or so different languages um, that, um, that, that Aboriginal people used in the 19th century. Uh, it, it's, it was adopted from European political theory in the 1970s by university educated urban Aboriginal activists. Now, the Mabo judgment recognised Aboriginal clans had their own laws. Um, that made them owners of their land, and that they and and they therefore had sovereignty over those territories. That this is the claim by Aboriginal people. Now it's true that they did have their own laws and they did um, have a form of ownership, um, but did, uh, uh, over some territories, in some cases, um, this this was exclusive ownership where they could where there was a, a laws against trespass. Uh, in other 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 cases. And, I, and this is certainly true in Tasmania, where I did a lot of research on the topic, um, there was no punishment for, for trespassing. The concept of trespass was unknown. People 
have their own uh, tracks through territories, uh, but they didn't claim them to be exclusive to these. But the, but the, the, but it was different in Northern Australia um, at, at other times. Um, uh, but the idea that because they had some form of ownership, therefore they have laws, and laws means they had to have governance, and governance means they had sovereignty, that is a connection which Henry Reynolds, if you read his books, he makes time and time again, he's been making the same claim for 20 something years now. Um, but uh, no Australian who owns a farm in the country or any one of us who owns a quarter acre block in the suburbs thereby becomes the sovereign of their piece of territory. It's absurd. Aboriginal people are legally no more privileged um, than um, ordinary Australians. And in modern nations, sovereignty belongs only to national governments, not because they are landowners, but because they have the necessary political authority and power. So the argument from um, Aboriginal land rights to um, sovereign status and, um, and um, exclusive, uh, exclusive um, rights to territory is, um, it doesn't exist. Um, and, and third, the idea that, um, that the Aborigines can have a spiritual sovereignty and, um, and um, the, the whites or the rest of Australia can have a political authority is, uh, is something that, um, that um, doesn't make any sense either. Um, sovereignty is, is, is an exclusive concept. Um, if there are more than one um, political force in a country, then um, there must be more than one, one uh, uh, sorry, if there's, if there's more than one political um, force in a territory, then there must be more than one territory that is uh, under sovereignty. Um, in modern nations, so, uh, um, in, in, you can either, if, 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 there are, if there are two claimants to sovereignty, then you can solve that by negotiation, uh, where one party gives up and the right to the other, or in some cases you have, you have a civil war and the, the winner, the, the winner um, who wins the war becomes the sovereign. Um, you, you can call um, a, a political arrangement a shared power, which is sometimes you hear in Australia we have shared power between the Commonwealth and the states, but um, but. Um, that is not real sovereignty. Sovereignty is an exclusive nation. Only one, uh, one party over a territory can have it. Now, there's, um, there's another part of this um, issue which I'm not going to go into tonight. Um, the Aboriginal political class, and I'm sure you've heard this many, many times, say that Australia was invaded, not settled, and that British colonisation was illegal. Uh, well, now these claims, I'll be very brief on this, these claims are partly a matter of international law, but also an issue within Australian frontier history. And um, in, the, in the 18th century, international law um, regards a settled colony was one in which at the time of its occupation by European power was either uninhabited or else inhabited by people whose political systems and laws did not amount to those of a nation state. Uh, and, and that status was um, endorsed in the New South Wales Supreme Court as, by, by uh, Judge Burton, as I mentioned. It was confirmed by the, um, the Privy Council in the, 18, in the 18, 18, 1889. Uh, and um, if today's Aboriginal elite are really asking that we go back and rewrite Australian legal history in order to accommodate their political demands. Now, the the historical grievance expressed by the Uluru Statement of the Heart could never contribute to reconciliation of or a more unified nation. That is the claim that they make. Um, they, they, um, um, but it is unsustainable. Uh, what we have is a bid for power, which even if it, it does win constitutional approval at, at the referendum that um, Anthony Albanese has said we are bound to have, um, it will dishearten its advocates in the long run. The little autonomous um, nations that they want to establish uh, should be regarded as a political fantasy. Um, and, and the failed history of the many secession movements and, uh, and, the, um, and the remote communities which were actually established 
uh, by white advocates in the 1970s and they were defined, they were funded uh, entirely by, um, by um, left-wing advocates who, who wanted Aborigines to go back and live their former lives. That has been a terrible failure. Um, it's, it's obvious from, from the, the cases that, we, that you read in the newspaper almost every week that um, the remote communities are a living hell um, and um, the track record of a 40-year experiment in self-determination and self-government uh, in what was called the homeland movement in remote Australia since the 1970s has already proved and keeps on proving that the longer it exists, the worse things become. Thank you.